From the center of the universe, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, this is the SDM Show with your host, Rob Cairns. The SDM Show focuses on business, life, productivity, digital marketing, WordPress, and more. Sit back, relax, grab your favorite drink, and enjoy the show. Here is Rob. Hey, everybody. I'm Rob Cairns. I'm the founder, CEO, and chief creator of Amazing Ideas at Stunning Digital Marketing. In this edition of the STM Show, I have my good friend Nev Harris joining me, and we're going to talk about finances for your agency. This is one episode you don't want to miss, as Nev drops many power bombs in the episode. So sit back, relax, grab your favorite drink, and listen to a great conversation that Nev and I had. This episode of the STM Show is sponsored by Stunning Digital Marketing the agency to handle all your WordPress website security needs. Go on over to stunningdigitalmarketing.com and find out how we can help you secure your website so you no longer have an issue with backups, being hacked, or your website being compromised. That's stunningdigitalmarketing.com. Hey, everybody. Rob Cairns here. Today, I'm here with my good friend, Nev Harris. and We're going to talk a little bit about financing and building an agency around financing. How are you today, Nev? I am fantastic. How are you, Rob? I'm doing good. It's always great to have you and to spend time with you. I, I should tell you, every time I spend time with you, I learn something, and I think you learn something. So I think this will be a, a little fun chat. So... Oh, yeah. Yeah. We were just talking in the pre-show that uh, Rob introduced me to another podcast called Business Wars, and I binged the hell out of it last weekend. I think what I listened to, about 20-some episodes in one weekend, it was fascinating. Yeah. You know, it's funny. um, When we go on that, we hear about people binge watching stuff like Netflix and Disney Plus and Amazon Prime, and here's you and I binging podcasts. You know, that's, that's quite ironic when you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait to binge more episodes this weekend when I'm doing stuff around the house. <laughs> yeah, and, by, and, by, and by the way, um, if you're bored, there's also a Business Wars book, and I don't know if it's available on Audible, but it's certainly available on Kindle. So check that out too. <laughs> oh, cool. So what I wanted to start off before we get into the world, the world of high finance, it's a question I like to ask <laughs> it because you started in WordPress. What's your WordPress origin story and how did you get into this? wonderful community we have all right well my my story is maybe a little nutty i had a uh, marketing company on the side and then i had a direct mail magazine where we had a whole bunch of local clients for that and i said to and i had a really talented designer and that was just wasting his talents doing this magazine and just designing ads for pizza companies and stuff so I said to him, I said, could you design websites? He said, I don't know. I said, we could give it a try. So um, we, <laughs> so we didn't know any better. And so we're like, uh, we're like, I said, I, I hear about this Wix thing. <laughs> so we, we decided to try Wix and then we tried WordPress and everything like that. And then what, what thing that we buy? We bought that really, I forget what it was, but a really popular thing back then, like about eight years ago or so um, that I think everybody used. That was actually a really crappy thing. But, um, and that, that's how we started out. Um, really funny, my agency website, the first site we built with, with the track it out was like on my agency website and that was in Wix and we never changed it the whole time. Cause we always had so many client projects to work on. We always said, you know, we need to, I said, I said, we need to go back and, uh, redo our website in WordPress. And so we had a bunch of like drafts, but you know, we always wanted to make it perfect. So we never launched any of them. Yeah, so. that, That's funny. It's like the shoemaker who never fixes his own kid's shoes, right? He goes everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, And that just shows you, though, that's just proof of the fact that people, you, you we're not, and I know you believe this, we're not selling WordPress, we're selling solutions. Like, you can sell WordPress, we don't even have a WordPress website, because you're not selling WordPress, you're selling the results that you get from the website. That is, that's so true, and we need to sell websites as a lead generation strategy, not you have to be on the web. And uh, again, it comes back to how you frame it and how you sell it. Yes, sir. So, so 
Today, I thought we'd talk about the world of high finance, something you're well acquainted with, you've kind of pivoted into. How did you make the pivot from doing your own agency to the financial side of things? Well, um, I, so <clears throat> we all have these goals in life. We have these dreams and, you know, I kind of accomplished uh, a lot of mine with my agency and I, um, and then I realized that, you know, I, 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 I got buyer's remorse <laughs> big time. I was, I was, I was, I was miserable. I was depressed. I was burned out and, uh, I had 11 people working for me and I realized that I, I, I just, I, didn't like what my job had become managing these people. We had to take on a lot of clients. And I realized I didn't like to work with a lot of different clients because half of them annoyed me. And, um, I didn't feel like I was making any difference. So, um, but on the side, so being that that's how I entered into WordPress this pivots right into that. I mean, it goes right into that, um, that, I didn't really have any WordPress experience. So I had to rely on people from the community and my friends that were so generous. And so I just always was giving back to people, trying to help them understand their finances, money and everything like that. And so they pushed me when I was talking to one of my friends one day, I was like, really, uh, she says, Nev, why don't you just like do this financing? I said, there's a real need for this. You've helped so many of us. And, and that, and so that, that's kind of how I, started with this, uh, uh, financing. So I started taking that more seriously than when COVID happened. Um, you know, it just really blew up. So, and that's why I'm here now. <laughs> yeah. And, and one thing I will say is, um, having gotten to know you really well the last year, you are pretty generous with your time and you've helped me, you've helped a number of people in the community. And I think that's what makes our community special is a lot of the key people will, will dive in and say, you need a hand, I'll give it to you. And you're certainly one of those people. So I really appreciate that. I, I like, I, I am one of those people, but the only reason I can be one of those people is because I had a hell of a lot of those people yeah. in the seven years leading up to me being able to give back. Yeah, I think I think that's so key, right? Is to give back and to help. And remember, we've we've all been there. I mean, we've all been there. I've been there, and uh, you know, I'm on this journey right now where I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to run things remotely, and uh, it's an interesting uh, journey too. So <laughs> it's it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. Um, well, if you figure out how to work from on an iPad, please let me know. Cause this has been my life goal for five years and I, <laughs> maybe six at this point, like trying to actually run a, run a business f from an iPad. And I've, I, I gave up and I bought a uh, MacBook last year to use on my travels. I'll, I'll share with the listeners a story while we talk about that. I had, um, and I think I've shared it on this podcast before, but I've had a professor back in 1986 at a community college in Toronto. And his dream, in those days we worked on mainframes and mainframe terminals, not even PCs. And his dream was to take his business and work on a beach on a portable computer. And everybody called him Billy Bob, and his name was Bill Warren, and said, you're crazy, Bill. This will never happen. You're not going to do this. Guess what? I can take my laptop, and work on a beach at the resort I go to in Dominican Republic and have Wi-Fi and do my business. So, you know, he was a, a visionary at the time. And I used to say to people, listen to him. He's a visionary. He knows what he's talking about. And a colleague of mine who I've known for 30 years came back to me the other day and said, you know, you were right. And I said, yeah, you just, sometimes you got to listen to people, right? And where they're going, so. Um, yeah, do you remember? I mean, you're like, I, I just remember this from uh, hearing stories when I was young from uh, like my, my dad, because he did a lot of traveling. But do you remember in the 80s when people when like, they would carry around uh, a, a computer that was the size of a briefcase, and then it, uh, a keyboard would flip down and the, the, the monitor was yep. about the size of an, a, an iPhone Max? My father was a CFO and uh, for an insurance company, CFO, corporate treasurer. And uh, he was one of the proponents. So two things he did was he had an Apple II Plus and he carried it okay. with, with a small green and white monitor and it all fit into this big briefcase. And when he wanted to take it into the office, he would just put the top on to take it in. 
Um, I still have that machine as a memento today because <laughs> that machine uh, was the reason I got into the technology business. It means so much to me. So, and Compaq actually had some, they called them portable, they were portable desktops. Same idea. They fit into like a briefcase and you carted this big thing around. And, and now we just carry these small laptops on our lap that is absolutely incredible, right? So, yeah. Yeah, this thing had a big metal handle. I remember yeah. my dad showed because he ne- he never had one, but his, his friends would because my dad was super anti tech, but because he was he was like a, an older guy, but um yeah, but I remember him telling me about. It. I was like, oh wow, and then now they've shrunk down to so small, so it's it's cool seeing all that stuff evolve. And since we're reminiscing and being in finance, you'll appreciate that. In finance, the key to finance is the spreadsheet, right? And to some right. degree. And I still have an original Apple VisiCalc box, which is, was the predecessor to Lotus, which was the predecessor to Excel. And I still have the original software media for that when it came out for the Apple II Plus, believe it or not, as a memento. Because without <laughs> that machine and that spreadsheet, I honestly don't think I'd be where I am today, interestingly enough. So, yeah, that's, 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 Super. I think I think it's fascinating how the things that you know happen in our childhood end up um, dire- directing us, like that we would never think, but end up directing us in ways that you know are so impactful in the future. Yeah, it's so true. Like the story about Bill Gates, you know, um, having access to one of the th- like at, in the middle of the night to one of the three supercomputers in the world. Yeah, and that's how Microsoft en- ended up getting built was because him and Paul Allen could sneak into a computer lab in the University of Washington that had one of the three supercomputers in the world at that time. Yeah. So. And, and then you look at the guys that, that founded Apple, Jobs and Wozniak were both hackers. Um, one of the the most well-known hackers in the world, a guy by the name of Kevin Mitnick, is like the FBI's biggest consultant because he was bored. <laughs> <laughs> so he, <laughs> he hacked computer networks and phone networks because he was bored. And now and now he's making over seven figures a year as uh, one of the government's biggest computer security consultants. It's, it's funny how what goes on in your childhood shapes where you are today. So true. So what you're saying is we're not going to have any super hackers in the future and we have Netflix and TikTok to thank for that. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> but... <laughs> So, because no, because nobody's going to ever be, because no kids are ever bored anymore because they just sit there and watch three hours of TikTok videos or, um, you know, get on Netflix and binge something. <laughs> I, I would disagree with you there. I mean, I think the biggest problem with kids today is they don't know how to use their brains and their imagination if they're not spoon fed sometimes. So, in our days, my, our, my parents would having four boys would kick us out of the house where I go, go to the park, go find something to do, go play, get lost. And we'd end up in the woods building a fort or figuring out how we could dig a hole under a tree. Or even my son, we were talking about the other day, him coming home and saying, Dad, my cell phone in the days of foot phones is wet. And me being an angry father looking at him and saying, how the hell did your foot phone get wet and where were you? Well, it turns out they were trying to jump across a small stream somewhere in the woods. <laughs> and, and, the, and you know, you think about that, and now you say to these kids today, use your brain, and they're lost. If it's not, ha- and it's one reason they don't read as much, because they like everything to be spoon-fed. And uh, one reason I like to read is, especially if I'm reading fiction or um, something like that is I can paint the picture in my head and actually see what I'm reading. And, uh, but the kids today don't have the bandwidth for that. They just don't. I kind of blame our schools for that because our school system, it teaches kids how to memorize and re- recite facts, but it doesn't teach them how to solve problems. Mm-hmm. So I think I think that's a real big failure in our school system. Like, and it, and honestly, like the reason I have a job is because our school system failed our kids so much that they don't understand the basics of finance. Yeah, it's it's so, so true. Um, you know, having come up in as a, as a programming student, kids learn to think A B C D, 
And the minute you go A, B, F or A, B, Z in the middle and they kind of look at you and say, but I didn't learn that. Well, didn't you learn how to think? And, you know, the segue into finance is a really good one. Um, I think basic finance should be part of every high school curriculum program. And in Ontario, they're starting to do that because we're starting to realize that finances is a big problem. I mean, you're a an 18-year-old kid going in a university. And the first thing that happens is the credit card companies all say, we know you're going to university. Here's a credit card with a $5,000. Right. Go do what you want with it. And and here's a free t-shirt. Sign up for this credit card. That's going to screw your life for the next 10 years. Yep. <laughs> and they don't learn young and they don't learn how to deal with money young. And that's a problem. But what they do learn is like uh, some complicated equation in Algebra 2 where most of them are never going to be math majors. <laughs> yep. Because that's important. <laughs> but the problem with not learning finance young is what happens is they don't appreciate stuff. So by example, I'll give you when I was um, uh, going to college one summer, I had my eye on a new stereo system that I wanted so bad. And my father looked at me and said, you're not getting it. You got a part-time job. Figure it out. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> so what I did was um, at that, that summer, I was working uh, for my dad's company, actually, doing some reports and uh, helping out and filling in with people on vacation. Every paycheck I gave them X percentage and said, put this away for me. And then when I got to the five or 600 bucks that I needed to buy the system, I went and bought it. And I had that system, believe it or not, for 15 years. But the reason I had it for 15 years is because I earned it and I didn't buy it on disposable income. I treated it better than if I'd gone in with a credit card and said, here's a credit card, give me that now and I'll worry about it all later. And there's truth to that, oh. I think. Oh, I believe that so, like, uh, so, so deep in my heart. Uh, when I was when I was growing up, my dad taught us. You know, he says, "Look, he says the the key to having uh, nice stuff in life is taking care of the stuff you buy." Mm -hmm. And um, you know, like my nephews, like, I, so I had a pair of Allen Iverson low cut. Um, original uh, tennis shoes yep. that they were, they were just my, like, I, I love them. And I, I kept them for like, I used to be a sneakerhead way back in the day. And I kept them for like 15 years mm -hmm. and they were, and one of my nephews was, and I kept them pristine. And one of my nephews was coming up and he started getting into sneakers and everything. He wanted expensive sneakers. And I, and I said to him, I said, okay, I said, I'm going to give you the, 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 this is your size right now. I'm going to give you these shoes, okay? Because, I mean, they're, they're iconic. You know, no, one's, no one possibly could have these. And, and so I gave them to him. Within, I'm not kidding you, within two weeks, they were ruined. Oh. Probably within a week because I probably didn't see them. And I, was, I, I looked at him. I said, how did you ruin these shoes? I've kept them in mint condition for 15 years. And I wore them. I wore them a lot. And uh, it's just because, you know, his parents bought him everything he wanted. Yep. And as soon as he wanted it, and when he ruined it or lost it or didn't take care of it, they replaced it. Yep. So he had no value for what anything was worth. Yeah, so, so, so true. So I'm going to start a new agency today. And uh, uh, congratulations. Oh, thank you. No, not, not that I need to. And <laughs> what's my number one financial problem before I even get into starting? So if if you're starting a new agency, if you're just starting from scratch, yeah. uh, I would say the number one concern you have is understanding your cost and understanding the difference in the kind of cost you're going to face. Okay. And what's the number one cost I should be looking at? Should it be staffing? Should it be cost of running the business, i.e. a website, um, you know, that whole side of it? Should it be the tools that I buy? Uh, what do you think? Well, I would say it's not so much what you're buying, it's how you're tracking it and knowing and pretty much just tracking it. So because costs are the foundation for the the rest of your business because you could price something and you can make a profit on it, but if you don't understand your cost, 
you know, you're just pr- pretty much get, you're getting lucky making a profit on it because if, if those if those costs spike on you and you don't realize it, all of a sudden you're doing the same thing. You're working, a, you're still working your fingers to the bone. You're doing everything great. All of a sudden you're making half the money you're making, which isn't fair. Doesn't make you happy. But, and you don't know how that happened. You think, man, business is just really hard. It's because you didn't understand how your costs factor into your business. Because like, <clears throat> let's take for example, you have your, what are your fixed costs? Now, fixed costs are just pretty much anything. And this is how I define them. And I, try, I like to simplify this stuff because these definitions in accounting and finance, it's super confusing. I almost think they built the language to design people to keep them out of it. You know, it's like the accountant's full employment plan. Confuse the hell out of everybody and they'll need us. So <laughs> I'm going to simplify this for you. If your fixed costs are anything that you pay on a monthly basis or a yearly or a quarterly basis, but that no matter what happens, you have to pay them. Okay. And then you have what's called variable costs. And I hate that word variable. So we're going to say project related costs. Now, project related costs then are the cost that you only incur, that you only have to pay if you take on a new job. And you're not going to, most of those are going to be like, say, especially when you're starting out, you probably don't have staff, you know, it's probably just you, but maybe there's an integration you have to do when you're building a website because the client really wants it to integrate into XYZ software and Zapier doesn't do it. So you think to yourself, all right, I need to go out and hire somebody to do this part of it, you know, so you go out and hire them. Well, you only have to pay that because of this project and then that goes away. So you just have to price that into that specific project. But other than that, you know, all the rest of your costs, then you have to pay every month, no matter what you sell. So for example, if you have, uh, if you have $10,000 in fixed costs, which you won't, when you do not have 10,000, when you're starting out, I'm just doing simple math and you sell um, three websites for 5,000 each. So you've made 15,000 and you have 10,000 in cost. You're like, great. I made 5,000 this month. That's fantastic. The next month you still have those 10,000 in costs, but now let's say you only sell one website. Now you've lost 5,000. So just understanding that base level of revenue you have to bring in to cover those costs and then understanding how, um, how those variable costs can, you know, add to that. But what we always look at though, is we always look at the fact that, Hey, look, this project's going to take 20 hours. You know, it's just going to take my time. So we say, you know what I could charge, you know, and especially when we're beginning, we always underprice in the beginning. I could charge a thousand dollars, 20 hours. I make $50 an hour. That's a pretty good hourly wage. You think to yourself, you know, but what you, what you don't like think of is if that's the only website you sell and you have all those fixed costs, you're not making that $50 an hour because you have to, um, so that, 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 that's why I feel costs are like the foundation of, you know, a business. No, I, I agree with you. One of the things that you said that really resonates with me, I found myself smiling and nodding my head to you, Nev, was project costs need to be built into the cost of the project. I've seen too many people in the web game, the marketing game, and say, oh, I just won't build that in. Well, I have a theory. And in my business, in my agency, my clients pay for every tool that I use one way or the other. (laughs) And (laughs) they're not going to want to hear that, but that's just the reality. It's built in somewhere. And I even go to the extent of... Uh, fixed cost is we all use payment services, right? Um, to pay the bill. Well, in Canada, we have this cool little thing called an email transfer. So you can send me an email transfer for the bill, which I can deposit right in the account. If you use a payment service, guess what, folks? You're paying the 3%. I'm not absorbing it. And I tell my client, it's right in their contracts. And, and they say, but why should I have to pay the 3%? I said, because it's in your contract. It's very simple. <laughs> or or send me the email transfer. And I don't take checks in my business, uh, except from oh, no. a couple. Um, I do some work with some political parties, and they have rules that they have to pay certain things by checks. But generally, as a rule, I don't because the world has changed. 
And people say, oh, I'll just absorb that 3%. Well, I'm going to tell you, folks, if you do three marketing projects in a month, and you start absorbing 3% on every project, that starts to get expensive. So, you know, you need to pass those costs on to the consumer, and you actually need to stop fighting this whole race to the bottom. I'll just outprice my competitor because if you keep doing that, you're not going to do very well in the end. Oh, yeah, because I, I always say there's, you know, everybody's scared to price higher because they don't think they're going to get the jobs. And then, so what you end up doing is you, you, you're like, I'll be more competitive for the low price strategy. It doesn't work in the web design business because everybody's at the bottom. All right. And then, so you're, you're super, even though, so you're super competitive. Like you said, it's a race to the bottom. Well, I'll do it for 5,000. I'll do it for four. I'll do it for three. I'll do it for 500. I'll do it for 400, you know, but you know, at the upper end of the scale, the people that are charging a lot. There, you know, there's not a lot of competition in that market because people are scared to enter that market. It's not necessarily that those people in that market are giving that much more value or having that much more talent. They just had the guts to, to, to price that high. And then people start paying that. And here's the thing. Like the, the customer that's willing to pay more money for a website is going to be easier to work with. And the customer who who wants who wants the uh, the deal. Nev, can I stop you for a minute? Can you say sure. one more time, please? <laughs> the customer that pays more money is going to be easier to work with than the customer always looking for a deal. And I'll say it this way: because if if they're saying if they're trying to if they want a a thousand dollar website, okay, a two thousand dollar website, okay. Versus a guy that wants a ten thousand dollar website, a guy that can afford a ten thousand dollar website, even if there's a small little problem that you know, or even if something's not exactly right, if he has to spend an hour on of his time with you to get that fixed, it's not worth the hour of his time to to argue with you about a fifty to a hundred dollar little thing. The guy that's get, paying a thousand dollars, who is like, oh my god, this is a ton of money. He will argue and argue and argue over twenty dollars. He will sap your time, energy, and will to even continue for like pennies because he does because it matters because that little bit amount of money matters so much to him. And and then again, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll even go further on that. It's it's probably one of their first websites. And if you have ever worked with people with their first website, you know they have no idea what to expect. You know they think getting the content is going to be a thousand times easier yeah. than it actually is going to be. So yeah. um, I, I I always like I avoid first time when I had my agency I avoided first time websites like a plague. I, I, I'm smiling as you go through that. And the reason I had to repeat that is people need to hear what you just said. Like they really do. Um, it all depends on what the, I call it value pricing. So I'll give you an example of that I have a client who has a high end WooCommerce store, uh, to the point he's making $50,000 profit a day. And I do all the security and the maintenance on that store. And he, is not getting the same pricing as somebody for his maintenance as some somebody that's got a five thousand dollar website. Let's be fair here, and he's on a twenty four by seven contract, so he, he's got any emergencies they get dealt with, they get dealt with quickly. And before we entered into this arrangement, for I took him on as a client, uh, somebody else was doing his maintenance but charging them bottom basement prices. And then when the site went down or had an issue, um, it was down for like days. He went down over a Canadian long weekend. And that was awful because frankly, the guy just looked at him and said, oh, you're paying me bottom basement prices. You're paying bottom basement. I'll get to it when I get to it. His net business loss of that site being down for three days was uh, $200,000. Well, so yes. what you do to clients like that is you actually charge them what I call value-based pricing. So it's worth $50,000 a day. So he needs to be on a maintenance plan that he's going to pay lots for because, frankly, he's making fifty grand a day. <laughs> and it's a business expense. And and people need to start to get with that. Do you, do you know what? He almost never calls. He pays his bills regularly. He doesn't complain. You send him an email every so often to make sure everything's okay. He's quite happy. And really what he's paying lots of money for 
is security knowing if something goes wrong it's there. It's like an insurance policy. Exactly. Exactly. That's it. Yep, 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 yep. Nail on the head. That's what I was going to say, security. Mm-hmm. And, it's and, insurance. And he's quite happy. And 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 then you've got these bottom feeders, and they and I call them bottom feeders, tire kickers, whatever terminology you want to use. And every time I look at a job that's in that realm, I say, why did I do this to my agency and why did I take it? Because it becomes a nightmare. And and frankly, I personally would rather take three or four jobs at a higher price level than take 20 jobs at a lower price level because I'm going to be less stressed doing the three or four. Now, people will listen to this and they'll be like, ah, oh, you know, never, Rob. I mean, you're, yeah, you're exactly right, but I, I can't get those jobs. And uh, like, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just starting out. I've only been doing it for a year. I just, or, you know, we, we just don't have the talent. I mean, if you look at really what goes into like a $20,000 website or a $10,000 website versus what goes into like the websites you're probably selling at 2000, it's not much. The only thing that the only real difference is the confidence in being able to sell it. Yeah. I'm not, um, I mean, when you get into super, if it's a super complicated e-commerce uh, or maybe some supply uh, inventory control system, you know, may, may, maybe that needs some special kind of knowledge. But most often, like the, the, the only thing that makes a website more expensive is the confidence of the person selling it. You know, Andy, because, I mean, at a certain point, we know how to use WordPress. Yeah, you know, Andy expertise. So I always say to clients, they say, why are you so expensive? I said, I, got, I have expertise that most people don't have. And Yeah, that's what I'm trying to... Yeah, that's a more. That's a better way to say my point. I'm saying we all like at a certain point we all have like similar expertise, unless it's a very niche kind of thing. Yep. And so it's just I like I'm selling websites more expensive than than Susie because I have more confidence in my expertise, mm-hmm. not more expertise than Susie does. Yeah, and so. it's not just websites. I mean, you come from a marketing agency background. It's all marketing, like. I do. A, oh yeah. I do a lot of email marketing uh, for clients, and uh, I've run email lists that have two hundred thousand names in, and I've worked with some big brands, and uh, I, we're talking Fortune five hundreds and leaders in their field. And people say to me, "How can you get off charging what you do?" And I said, "Because I can, I will, and I know what I'm doing." And it, and it's not about the money. What it comes down to is people choose who they work with because of a trust factor. So if you don't trust what I'm going to bring exactly. to the table, I'm good. Go find somebody else because you're probably going to be a pain. <laughs> <laughs> so so I always say, like when you talk about value-based pricing and everything like that, and this goes back to what we're, why I said cost, why under, having a rock solid understanding of your cost. I, I always say pick a problem and that you're solving with your agency that is um, that you you could charge a, a third of what it costs to solve that problem. So y- the problem you're solving like is three times your price mm-hmm. because what happens, because then when you, un- and then you could look at it and say, okay, well I'm solving a $10,000 problem with this. And then I want to charge $8,000 for a website. Well, y- you know, um, uh, that's, you know, there's, that doesn't really, you know, there is that $2,000 gap, but the person, the, 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 the customer is not really going to see that. Or you say to yourself, you know, I want to charge 10000 for a website, but I'm solving a $3,000 problem. You know, just, or you say, I want to charge, you know, I have this problem. I have this niche. I'm really excited about it. I want to do it. I'm solving a five, but I'm solving a $5,000 problem. And, um, and you're like, okay, well, I'm really passionate about, it. I really want to do this niche and I'll grow into it. So I'll just, but you have 5,000 in costs yeah. and then, you know, you still, you, you can't, you can't be profitable. You can't even keep the lights on at that level. So, you know, it's all about understanding your costs, understanding the value of the problem you're solving and then pricing accordingly. Yeah. And, and, and outside your business, figuring out what kind of lifestyle you want to live and how. I mean, that's a factor. And, uh, you know, yep. I if I hadn't figured it out, I don't think I'd be in a position to be taking my business on the road a quarter of the year. I, I really don't. And I'm in that position. And that's a really good position to be in because I'm going to do stuff I want to do. I, 
And my motto kind of is work to live, not live to work. You know, I think, um, I, and that's where I had a friend and I was helping her out with this and I, and I had to open her eyes of this. She had an agency and she grew a pretty big agency, got burned out, Jesus. quit, you know, freelanced for about traveled, you know, digital nomadic for about seven years. And then, you know, um, started, you know, growing this, then, then started getting so, so busy with work that, you know, she started growing an agency again. And I said, are you nuts? I said, you're absolutely, and she was getting miserable again and she was getting overwhelmed. And I said, and she says, but I have all these people I need to make money. And I have all these people that want it. I said, if you have all these people, I said, what you need to do is raise your prices to the point where, you know, you're closing about, instead of closing a hundred percent of the people you talk to and turning away the rest of the people and feeling bad about it, raise your price to where you're closing 70% of the people, yep. you know, 80% of the people and that your, but your price is high enough. You'll, you'll have less stress, make more money and you won't, and you won't have to, um, you won't have to run a company that you hate. Yep. So it's just all about, you know, y- y- like, um, w- it, it came up in post status, Slack like about a month or so ago, which was just like where somebody was like, scale, 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 scale. If you're not scaling, you're failing, you know? And I was like, no, you know, run the business you want to run and you can't, and you, you could be extremely uh, profitable. You know, you can make, you can make as much money as you want, you know, and you know, unless you want to make billions and billions, you, you know, at, you know, at whatever level of staffing or whatever level of customers that fits your lifestyle. And the other thing is, too, is if you're building that business and you're scaling, the first thing I say, and it's not really a financial topic, but it's worth mentioning, is look at your agency and say, how many of these tasks can I automate? Because if you're doing something three or four times a day, you need to find a way to automate it, and you need to do it now. And that will save you financial costs in the end. You won't have to hire somebody to do that. You automate it and let it go. And people say, oh, automation's bad. I would humbly disagree. Um, and the other thing to look at is if you really want to get involved in that discussion you were just having, of, there's a really good book by Michael Killen out there. Um, Sell Futures, Not Features. And go read it. I love Michael talks. Mike's a great guy. Yeah, he talks all about that. He's been on the podcast a couple times. We talked after he released his book earlier this year, and um, and he talks about exactly what we're talking about. So he's a great resource. Um, yeah, my, Mike. I was just say like about Mike. I mean, if you want to talk about some of the, um, I mean, I don't know Mike. Uh, I've never met him in person. I've had the privilege of talking to him a couple of times online, but. Uh, truly, genuinely nice, caring people that give back to the community and every everything like that. You know, that is is not selling snake oil or something like that. Mike is truly one of those people. Yeah, I I know when he released his book earlier this year, I reached out to him knowing the release date was coming and said, "I want to drop a podcast within a week of that book coming out because I know it's going to be gold coming from Mike." And anything he says is. You just need to pay attention. That's that's all I can say. You'll thank yourself. I just reread it for the second time, actually. So yeah, he's a quality guy. Quality. I, you know, I, you said this not a, it's not a finance discussion. I, I wholeheartedly disagree with that. Okay. Um, I think uh, so. When I talk about cost, getting back to this, so all, all all what I'm talking about, and it's hard for me to like. I'm not going to try to describe it here because it's hard enough to describe some some concepts on podcast. But I have a, what's called a pricing pyramid. And at the bottom, when I talk about foundational stuff and I talk about cost, I also talk about automating that kind of automating stuff and systematizing stuff. Because what that does, when, when you're automating something, when you're systematizing something, you can predict the cost of that. I know how much Zapier is going to cost me a month. Yeah. I know if I do this many automations and I pay this, you know, what it's going to cost me. What you, if I'm just doing stuff out of the blue and I'm like, you know what, maybe I'll do that. You know, maybe I'll pay somebody to do that. You know, um, maybe it'll take an hour. Maybe it'll take five hours. You just, you, you never know. And you can't predict costs that way. When, but when you automate something, 
when you systematize something, you pretty much know 95% of the time exactly to the penny what that's going to cost you. And then, and like I said, once you know your cost, you're able to price so much more efficiently. And then when you're able to price so much more efficiently, you're able to profit so much better. When you're able to profit so much better, you're able to take care of your employees more, get more customers because you have a marketing budget. You're able to do more things in your personal life. You're able to support more of the organizations and causes you care about. It's just, it, it all snowballs and it all starts with that cost. And like I said, in, at the foundational level, one of his system, uh, systematize and auto, automate. So I think it's a financial topic and I love it. <laughs> that listeners is the 100% gold in this whole podcast. And if you get anything out of what Nev and I are talking about, go listen to that section again, because that's like jackpot. Um, I'll t- share with you something I was doing two weeks ago. I sat down on a Saturday and I pulled all the SaaS costs I had from my agency. And I do this with clients and I hadn't done this for myself in a while. And I said, what am I using and what can I get rid of? And I took all the costs in the spreadsheets and said, oh, this brings this value. This brings this value. This I can do with this. By the time I was done, Nev, I saved myself $1,000 US a month. I think yeah, it's I something that agencies don't look at very often. They just put costs on a credit card, they forget about them, and they let them go. So I, I will. Um, uh, I have a worksheet on my website. It's free. You can download it. It's called the Expense Killer. Um, and you think, somebody like me who teaches all this, you, you might think, oh, I, I understand this stuff. I'm on top of that stuff. I don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. I don't have to do that. I, like my my company, okay, I, I, when, when I had multiple companies too, I use this worksheet every six months yeah. because here's the thing. Things always have a tendency of creeping in. So, I mean, I know this stuff. I preach this stuff. I talk this stuff every day. I teach this stuff and I still use this worksheet because things will creep in. And I, I've, I've, I've heard, yeah, a thousand dollars a month. I've heard that. And when I say that to people, they're like, nah, nonsense. I can't, I, I mean, I might have $20 a month. And then the, people always have like, I would say five to 10 times more than they think that they could save. Because this one of the, one of the good things about my worksheet too is, and we've talked about this is light is like services. It's like, it says when you, when, when you walk through this worksheet, it says to you, like you, 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 you list out all your expenses and you walk through a couple questions. Is there anything that you are already paying for? that will that duplicates this service mm-hmm. because here's the thing we, we we have this idea that we need the biggest and the best in its productivity and the the best software is going to make us perform better and it's going to save us money for because time is money and everything like that well that's true but only to a point like if you have if clickup has time management and and I don't use clickup enough so I don't know how great their time management is so but if it does and but and you pay for toggle and click up, maybe you just use the time management and click up. You know, maybe you don't need toggle. Yep. So um, Google Drive, for, may, maybe you have a Microsoft Office subscription. I mean, Office is so much better than uh, uh, G- Google Docs, but Google Docs is free if you have your email with Gmail with, with G Suite or whatever they're calling it this month. Yep. So there's all those services that are just, you know, that, that we're duplicating, that we're paying again. And, you know, it all adds up. So how do you get to a thousand dollars a month? You get, um, uh, it's, you know, ten hundred dollar services or uh, you, you, you get what I'm saying. Yeah. And, and I'll give you an example of that with this podcast. I do transcription. I do transcriptions. So I do a transcription of every podcast and I used to pay for a transcription service. I used to use otter.ai, which I love, but here's the thing. Microsoft Office on the online version, if you pay for Office, gives you so many hours of transcription service for free a month. All you do is upload the file and it spits it out for you. The minute I figured I that out, did not know that. Yeah, the Otter.ai subscription went goodbye. And I happen to have, because I have a family version of um, Office, I happen to have two accounts. So both two accounts actually get me through what I need on a monthly basis, and it's cheaper than paying otter.ai on a monthly. 
Interesting. And that's the things you need to look at. Like, are you, are you paying for multiple services? Um, and I, I'm not advocating don't pay for stuff, but does the free tier do you enough to get you what you need, especially if you're starting out? Like, do you need that or do you need something more advanced? And, I, and I'm saying, like, honestly, if you don't need that, don't pay for it. Like, things like that. And look at, am I better off paying monthly than paying yearly? I have some stuff I pay monthly for just because I want to be in the position that if I want to turn it off, I can't and save the money. Um, is it worth paying the extra money yearly? Is it that much of a discount? Do I have the money now? Is the money better off being spent somewhere else now? Right? Things like that. So when you hear me talk about cost, 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 I want, yeah, you made an excellent point. I want to I bring this home. When you hear me talk about cost, 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 you're like, oh, there's the finance guy just saying lower cost. I'm not saying lower cost because you could, I'm saying costs are good. You know, we need cost. Costs are how we, we, if we leverage our costs to make a higher profit, we just need good costs. There's a ton of good services out there that your business needs. There's a ton of good employees that your business needs. There's a ton of good, like marketing expense is a little harder to say, you know, attribution is like that unicorn out there. You know, where did it really come from? But, you know, there's a ton of things we have to spend money. I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of spending money. And I'm a finance person. I'm not. I'm not saying don't spend money. Is you know because that's very limited. That that's 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 a um that that's a very limited way of thinking. I'm more of a blue ocean. Like there's like uh, and I forget the term I'm looking for, but um it's just you know there there's a world of possibility out there. We just got to take care of it. We just got to go after it. You know, and to go after it, we need the tools to go after it. But I'm just saying, spend your money wisely. Mm-hmm. So spend spend as much money as you need to spend, but just be sure it's being spent wisely. Yeah, and sit down and if you're starting an agency or you're into an agency, actually do a budget. Like do you, again, it comes back to do you really know what you're spending on fixed and variable and project costs in your business? I so I'm sorry. Mo- it's okay. Most people don't know. Yeah. And here's the thing about a budget. And here's the reason people resist budgets. So because budgets are restrictive there, um, we started our like business. We work for ourselves because we don't like to be told what to do. I don't like somebody telling me what I, what I have to do, you know, all the time. I actually like it when, you know, people say, Hey, Nev, this really needs to get done. Cause I could be a little unfocused. So, but, um, <laughs> this is what's really important. But in general, I don't want people saying I can, or I can't do something. And, you know, as entrepreneurs, we're, 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 we're vastly more feel strongly about that. So, um, and that's why we resist budgets because we want the freedom and the flexibility to do what the hell we want to do when the hell we want to do it. And that's why we started our business. And, uh, but here's the thing I say budgets, especially the way I show the budget is it's very empowering. It very much lets you achieve your goals. What it, in my view of a budget, it says like you design a budget around what you want not around what costs you're cutting. It's it's to enable you to achieve what you really want to achieve. Because what happens is, you know, like the things that we really want in life, they cost more. Yep. And uh, and so if we're wasting money, like every day a little bit, like you want to know how to, how to waste $10,000, spend $27 a day. Mm-hmm. So because 20, like if you spend $27 a day, you will spend 10,000 in a year. So if you budget correctly, if you have a budget that's focused on, that's giving every dollar that you have a job that's saying, okay, I want you to, I want you to do this for me. And then you can look at your, and then if you want to spend something different, you want to spend something more, and then you have something to weigh it against. You can go back to your budget and say, okay, I want to buy this new thing. What in my budget do, do I need to get rid of? And you're like, I don't want to get rid of anything in my budget. Then that thing's not a priority. But if it's something you want to buy and you're like, okay, okay, I could maybe cut this back a little bit and I could cut this back a little bit. Or if it's something you really want to save for, put that into your budget. Put the savings for that into your budget. And then you know you want to buy new uh, Mac Studios for the team and it's going to be $15,000. And then when, a, when, when an expense comes up, you know, you could look at that and say, I have the money to buy it, but 
it will put my purchase of those MacBook Studios off three more months. Mm -hmm. Is it worth kicking those MacBook Studios down the road? And you could say to yourself, hell no, I don't want this, you know, like it it could be like a new, uh, a fancy new office chair. You know, it's like, I'd rather have the MacBook Studio than a, than a fancy new office chair, you know? So then, and then you're, you're giving it some to weigh it against it. It's comparative. Mm -hmm. I agree. What um, do you think is the number one financial problem that agencies have? <laughs> so I think <laughs> here, here. So I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to step it up a level, a level big picture wise, um, because there is there. Individual agencies have different problems. Okay, yep. but the big problem that all agencies have is the lack of clarity into the operations of their business. Mm -hmm. Because you know nobody wants to look at financial statements. You know, um, I don't want to look at like these big, long, confusing financial statements. And I actually enjoy that stuff, but they're just because you're f trying to find a needle in a haystack. So I mean, whether it's pricing your problem, cost your problem, it's like revenues your problem, sales your problem. Like, you know, um, uh, at different points in an agency's life, they're all going to be the biggest problem they have. Yep. But how do we know what the biggest problem is and what we need to focus on without spending tons of time? And that's where I, like, I'm a big proponent of having KPIs, key performance indicators, like numbers that we could look at that tell us, hey, things are going smoothly. Hey, this might be a problem. This probably needs to be looked into. And with something like that, you have five of them, you look at them, you know, a couple of times a week, you know, for five minutes, you know, and then you say to yourself, hey, everything's running smoothly. I don't have to worry about anything, you know, or hey, there's a red flag here that I might need to dig into. And that's how, um, and that's how you run a business because it's like you're running the business by knowing, by heading off the problems before they happen. So if that makes any sense. And and finances is an ongoing look at, not a set it and forget it, which I think a lot of people do and make that mistake. So Or but I mean you could have you could have KPIs. Like I was just working with um a client last week and we we, we, we came up with actually KPIs for his whole business. For for everything that's happened in his business. He he really geeks out on this stuff. So we really went went in depth. I don't suggest everybody do this, but he wanted this like dashboard that he could look at and just be able to pinpoint where every, every bit of his business is. Cause what we're working with him is he wants to work himself out of his business. Yeah. Yeah. He wants to, uh, he wants to run his business from a very high level. And we're, and at, if that he needs, he needs extreme clarity into what his team is doing. And so that's what we're working. But for, for the average person, it's like, you know, you like we want to we, we want to know about problems and be able to solve them before they become problems. No, I so don't. we want to be more proactive. So in solving the problems, because I'm telling you, like, you're always going to have a variety of different problems in your in your agency. And you just want to know before they become, you know, before, you know, you want to know that you have cancer. That's why you get a screening before, you know, you know, you have cancer. Yep. I, that might be a very I would agree. analogy. And if it is, I apologize. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I would agree wholeheartedly th with that philosophy. Um, this discussion has been amazing. I'm sure it's going to get some people some food for thought. If somebody wants to get a hold of you and wants to work with you, Nev, what's the best way? Um, you could uh, reach out to me on Twitter at the Nev Harris. Um, LinkedIn, um, I think, uh, like, just uh, search for Nev Harris, um, or my website's nevharris.com. You could contact there. We have, uh, um, or, um, yeah, I would say those those would be the three best ways. If you want to hear me ramble about all sorts of crazy stuff, I have a podcast, too, uh, Profit and Impact. Yep. And, and check it out, because anything Nev does is worth its weight in gold. And thanks for your time, oh, Nev. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. Have yeah, a great sure. day. This episode of the STM show is sponsored by Stunning Digital Marketing, the agency to handle all your WordPress website security needs. Go on over to stunningdigitalmarketing.com and find out how we can help you secure your website so you no longer have an issue with backups, being hacked, or 
your website being compromised. That's stunningdigitalmarketing.com. A very special thank you to my good friend, Nev Harris, for joining me on this edition of the SDM Show. Thank you for listening to this edition of the SDM Show. The SDM Show is brought to you by Rob Garens and Stunning Digital Marketing. For more information about Rob Garens and Stunning Digital Marketing, go to stunningdigitalmarketing.info. From here, you can connect to us on social media, go to our website, and even go to the podcast to subscribe. This podcast is dedicated to my late father, Bruce Cairns. Dad, I miss you very much. Keep your feet on the ground. Keep reaching for the stars. Make your business succeed.